Uh, th this is my first time at McGill, and uh, like all of the other contributors, some of whom I heard earlier on, you prepare well for this. And because the topic tonight is serious, probably the 51st shade of grey, it's a very grey topic to talk about, uh, the reform of the public sector, where we're going as a country, and so on, I prepared well. I put it all down on paper. But as I was waiting for dinner this evening, uh, I overheard a gentleman speak to two ladies. And he was reading from the brochure, and he said, what's next? And he said, well, it's about public accounts, and it's about public sector reform. And he said, it'll be a bit of a yawn. I think we won't bother. <laughs> so I said, that's... Uh, <laughs> I felt my balloon, balloon a bit punctured at that stage. So then I, I, I sat at dinner. I won't mention the man's name, so he needn't worry. And uh, he, he, he said to me, uh, I said, have, has it gone well? And he said, oh, yes, it has gone very well. He said, uh, I, I would expect that the, the room will be full again this evening. He said, they didn't come just for you. He said, they would have been there anyway. <laughs> so I said, I said that, that's, that's okay, that's fine. Uh, but in spite of all of that, I want to thank the organisers of McGill School for giving me the opportunity to um, deliver what a Dáil colleague recently called my single transferable speech on public sector reform. Um, that was Willie O'Dea. And you can always depend on your own for constructive criticism. much more than it protected the frontline workers. Very little reforming was done until the Troika rode into town and began kicking the current government into action. But determining how much progress has actually been made is difficult. There have been reductions in staff, but was this done crudely? And have we lost people we should have retained? How many people have been rehired and at what cost? Actually, numbers lost depend on how you separate hard facts from fiction in government press releases. Now, again, a government is depending on conflicted trade unions and public servants to implement programmes that should be driving and controlling itself, using a team of independent external professionals. Again, a government is showing lack of backbone, or maybe there are just two backbones fighting with one another. But it's again a failure of leadership. And when you take into account who negotiated the agreement and who is largely implementing it, is it that difficult to come to a decision about its worth? I imagine it is worth as much as an omelette made without breaking eggs. Eighteen months after this government came to power, most of the quangos and the secretariats that support them are still in place, which may be the reason the promised clean-out is taking so much time. Public sector reform, in my opinion, will proceed at a snail's pace. The government will crow loudly and walk gently and slowly over eggshells. Like previous governments, it lacks at least four essentials necessary to deal with the problem. A clear vision about what needs to be achieved, an understanding of how it can be achieved, an appreciation of just how serious the problem is and how urgently it needs to be addressed and crucially, the courage and maybe the ability to take on the task in a meaningful manner. And it does not understand that it is a culture rather than people that it's dealing with. I believe the outcome will be a failure of leadership. So why do we radically need to reform our public service? Because, as I have said in the past, and other ministers have said, from this government and the last, it is not free, uh, fit for purpose and is becoming a weight too heavy to bear on the shoulders of this economy. Tennyson put it well, the old order changes, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways. Least one good custom should corrupt the world. He was talking about change being the only certainty and telling us that those institutions, political parties, cultures and countries that do not embrace it no matter how good or great they originally were, stagnate and finally die or are destroyed. 
Look at Fianna Fáil, whose reliance on its culture of blind loyalty and obedience drove it over the cliff, taking most of the blindly loyal and obedient with it. Now it's beginning to waste time worrying about the past and trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We should leave him there and concentrate on the future by building a party that does its politics the way it should be done, with passion, determination and new viable solutions and ideas. There is really no use blaming people in the public service for the decrepit state it is now in. The slide into that condition began some time ago. Those people were overpowered by the culture and they committed to the instincts of the collective with its suspicion of individuality and exceptionality and its desire to resist change and defend the status quo. That is how spent cultures survive and they self-perpetuate until they self-destruct unless a strong exterior force intervenes which is what successive governments have not done. And I believe this government isn't doing it either. Our public service, like a number of others in Europe, as it is now becoming obvious, is unable to deal with the needs or pace of a modern economy. The many, many good people in it at all levels are hostages to a culture that it's passed its sell-by date and that is becoming dangerous, heavy ballast on a ship trying to right itself. For the sake of the public service and the sake of the country, something has to be done about this situation and done quickly. I want to be very clear about where I stand in relation to the people in the public service as distinct from the culture of the public service. The service is full of good people at all levels. Frontline workers deserve great credit for the work they do keeping antediluvian systems operating. I have met many senior public servants that any country would be proud to have. They do not worry about change and will embrace and welcome the challenge and the opportunities that it brings. If they can escape from the culture, they will be willing participants in the reform process. Recently, a senior public servant told me that the core values of the service were honesty, integrity, impartiality, respect for the law, respect for persons, diligence, responsiveness and accountability. All very Corinthian, necessary and laudable, even if I have some difficulty with responsiveness and accountability. But generally I agree, and it, it, it is how that culture sees itself. But if professionalism, transparency, personal responsibility, value for money, speed, vision, state-of-the-art management systems, controls and human resource practices, and a commitment to excellence are not added to the list, Ireland will be left behind because a public service that is Corinthian, in both meanings of that word in fact, is ill-equipped to meet the challenges facing this country nationally and internationally, which the following example illustrates. Four years ago I was a junior minister. I did everything I could to persuade officials in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment to finish the work I was told they were doing for some years, updating our Companies Act. Business leaders will tell you that a clear, understood act is a major plus for any country they are thinking of investing in. Every obstacle was placed in my way. Preventing a politician from involving himself in public service matters was more important than serving the needs of the country. After at least 10 years, we are still waiting for the publication of that bill. And I am waiting for action from Richard Bruton. We cannot afford a culture that supports and promotes that reactionary, indifferent attitude, and we desperately need ministers who will confront it at every turn. Competition among nations for jobs, tax, exports, natural resources, and inward investment is intense and growing, and with it the need for public servants that believe, think, act differently than was and is the case. We live in a world where every organisation in our country has to be involved in commerce and obey its rules. I see our public sector as a major pillar of our economy. I don't want it to be in the back seat. I want it to be confidently up front, supporting, advising, urging on our businessmen and entrepreneurs, 
giving ministers real best advice, arguing for it if necessary, and ensuring that public service organisations paid for out of the public purse are managed and run in accordance with the standard of private sector best practice. In the future, much more will be required of senior and middle managers in the public service. Attitude, qualities and qualifications will be required, which for historic and cultural reasons and restrictive employment practices are rare in many European countries, including Ireland, who rely heavily on generalists and place too much value on consensus, which in my opinion has contributed greatly to the state that Europe is actually in today. The exception, of course, is Germany. Some speakers dealt with this earlier on. Particularly, and one or two others, in my experience, who have hardened their socialist heart with sensible doses of capitalism. You can see that in Germany's stand on Europe today. It is listening to Nietzsche, who, echoing Tennyson, said, pity preserves that which is ripe for destruction. German money will not be spent on propping up poor management and sloppy thinking. Irish taxpayers' money shouldn't either. And the Irish public service should be proudly and confidently in the forefront of value for money management. Leaders in the public service should face down this cult cultural fear of change and take hold of Excalibur to sever the change that binds us to the past. They should accept that it must take itself, make itself fit to face the challenges of a modern economy and employ or hire professionals that would help with that work. That task cannot be undertaken without the active involvement, encouragement and support of Leinster House and Liberty Hall, neither of whom, in my opinion, have shown much appetite for anything uh, carrying this, the description of radical, apart from rhetoric, since they left the ark. More or less, all of what I have said about the public service could be said about these weather-beaten, crumbling pillars of our society. Both of them have, the, have about the same eagerness to embrace change as Willie O'Dea has to avoid a microphone. So that, that makes it nil all for Willie and I. Take trade unions. Okay. Okay. Trade unions need to take a long look of how the lack, uh, uh, at how their lack of engagement with modern labour relation practices has helped to maintain a culture that has done so much damage for so long to our public service and the working lives of our public servants. Unions in the world have travelled far from the days of Todd Puddle Martyrs or James Connolly. Workers are in a much better place and attending their higher needs is now at least as important as their pay and conditions. That will require unions to counter the growth of cultures that trap people in dependency. Union cooperation will be needed if government is to achieve the radical reforms that are required in the public service. It is important that they see themselves as players on Team Ireland who can be relied upon to counter the labour market competition that we are facing, not just from countries with no labour laws, but from advanced countries like Germany. Their unions, employers and workers have accepted the realities of the market and cooperate with and respect each other in a manner that makes Germany a world leader in industrial relations, which is a huge economic plus for that country. It is an extraordinary fact that in discussions regarding public service reform, no one to my knowledge has made the point that a modernised professional public service with motivated people doing work and contributing to our economy might pay better and might need more people as a result of cost savings and productivity exercising their positive effect. And that is an absolute realistic possibility. Finally, we come to Leinster House, the home of great visions, great leadership, social conscience, reform, rectitude and rigour. Even I can sometimes get carried away with the greatness of it all. <laughs> but the pity it is that there is no evidence to show that that which the inmates believe they are providing ever gets past the gates. It either stops at a microphone on the plinth or it gathers dust in a government department. And that is what I'm afraid of in relation to public sector reform. You will not get real reform in the public service until the people of Ireland put backbone in, into Leinster House. That is not an obligation they have taken too seriously in the past. But I believe that that's changing as in the last general election. All change and reform begins at the ballot box. The politicians in Leinster House were given responsibility for driving and leading change. 
It is the fault of politicians we have in steady, gentle change down through the years. And too often we have failed to deliver the lead leadership and good governance that this country now requires. I believe that politics has lost its way in the Dáil. It's too soft to deal firmly and powerfully with the many reforms now necessary by so many years of inaction. How can a Dáil that, nearly 20, that for nearly 20 years has been unable to reform itself and has handed out power like snuff at a wake, transform the country. It wasn't Lehman Brothers, the public sector, trade unions and greedy bankers that brought this country to its knees. Other better run countries avoided that. It was bad government, governance, weak leadership, lack of rigour and the absence of a strong desire to make a difference which should be at the heart of politics from all parties in the Dáil to a greater or lesser extent that brought us to our knees. If governments didn't govern, govern, somnolent oppositions did not hold them to account. We are on our knees because governments whose primary duty is to keep their country safe did not do that job and they were joined by others who shared at least part of that duty. And my experience of the current government of rectitude, reform and particularly rhetoric does not encourage me to believe that much will change anytime soon. And without wishing to diminish in any way our part in what happened, it wasn't all down to Fianna Fáil riding a wave of financial madness. Let's keep it real. The trade unions, opposition parties, senior civil servants and regulators all had their surfboards out. So if you do not keep it real, you are already making another mistake. The management of the country is in disarray. Politicians say they are in charge, but they're not, because they are afraid or unable to use the power that they have. Public servants, they are not, say they are not, but substantially they are. For instance, if you look at the county managers throughout the country, they run the country, and the local politicians, if you like, are glove puppets of that management. All of that needs to change. Political parties pretend to be on the far right and left, when in fact they are all leaning that way, from the position in the middle using outdated ideologies that they no longer believe in to protect brands the country no longer cares much about. And while they try to work out to go in a world where socialism and capitalism are working on their relationship and considering marriage, real politics will have to engage with the consequence of that marriage and how best to use the fruits of its projects. I would just like to, I have quite a lot more to say, but I, I, I'm taking the nudges I'm getting here from my left. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just finished by saying this to you. I believe that politics can make a difference. I believe that a reformed, professional, confident and proud public service would be a huge asset to our economy and our people. I am passionate about reform and I want to encourage a wide-ranging public debate about the road we should take and the goals we should aim for. The fact about that I am direct about what I see as obstacles to progress does not stop me from being positive. We are a proud, resilient and creative people. Our businessmen and entrepreneurs have built successful international companies, some of them world leaders in their field, and they continue to do so. It is clear that they have Ireland's interests at heart and that they are doing what they can to help. We need to listen to them when they talk about the need for reform and, and the suggestions that they make. Remember this, no person, family, business or country would keep feeding their liabilities and starving their assets without going broke in a very short period of time. Also, we need to realise that they are becoming impatient and have other options. They know what it takes to build successful organisations and they know lack of professionalism and effort when they see it. They will not pay for it. Our political leaders need to be impatient about rebuilding this country. Our people are in a hard place. They have not been kept safe. But this is a time when strong, visionary leadership can work wonders. It is a time when politics can reclaim the ground that it has lost by leading the climb up the mountain of challenges and opportunities that lies ahead. Politicians and trade unions and public servants should accept the responsibility and grasp the opportunity they now have to make a real difference. There can be no holding back, no fudges, no turning away from tough decisions and hard miles and no time for wasting. We are playing against the world and we have a match to win. And Ireland is calling all of us onto that field of play. Thank you.